Hey, what's up? In today's video, I want to show you guys a few small changes that you can make in your life to lower your A1C. And just like how messy my desk is right now, you can see I've got a lot of projects going on. When life gets hectic, sometimes we forget to take care of our diabetes. Just like the last couple of days got hectic for me, my desk is a mess now. But I'm going to show you, just like how I'm going to push all this stuff off my desk in just a minute, how you can make a few quick changes that are easy that will lower your A1C. So I'm going to clean this up and then we'll get right to it. Oh, one more thing. I am not a doctor. This is not medical advice. I am a coach, trainer, nutritionist, all that great stuff, but I am not a doctor. So this is not medical advice. All right? All right. All right. So now that we're ready for the quick wins, got the desk cleared off, life makes sense again. I want to jump in and chat with you guys about your easiest win, but it will take some work up front. Does that make sense, right? Well, it's because once you get it figured out, it's a set it and forget it kind of thing for the most part. And it's going to be your overnight basils. If you can figure out how to keep your blood sugars in range while you sleep, your A1C will improve. It's the easiest hack to the game. Now, how do we improve this, right? We got to figure out how our blood sugars are reacting. If you're running high overnight, maybe you need a little more basil. If you're running low during the night, waking up, having a snack, you might need less basil. This is where you can bring in your doctors and say, hey doc, uh, I noticed these patterns. And they're going to go, oh my gosh, you wrote that down? You're my favorite patient. And they're going to help you sort that out, hopefully. Right? Uh, now, once you get those overnight basils set properly, your basal insulin, and you stay in range all night long, as long as you're sleeping the proper amount, right, seven to eight hours, that's one third of your entire day. It's a third of your life which also means it's a third of the responsibility going into your A1C. So if you get your overnight blood sugars in range, that's one third of a day checked off. Now you have that. It's a green. It's a pass. It's a go, right? Everything works and you get that whole free pass to lower your A1C. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. So let's get those overnight blood sugars in check so you can get that one third of your entire day as a free pass. Now, the second hack, number two, is not going to apply to everyone, but for those of you who have access to it, a CGM, or a constant glucose monitor, is going to make a massive difference in your A1C, and it will also open the gates into a new term called time in range. Now, that's for another video. We'll get into that later. But if you have a CGM, it enables you to see your blood sugars overnight, so you don't have to wake up every two or three hours and check them. You sleep through the night, and it lets you know the next morning when you look back at it what those blood sugar numbers look like. It's pretty cool, right? Now I'll show you a quick example of what that looks like on an insulin pump because I got my numbers on there. They're hey, looking pretty good, all right? I'm gonna open this up, check that out. Those numbers right there, my blood sugar is 146, and those are the last three hours. It's amazing what we have today in technology. So what I can do is look at the report from last night, see where my blood sugars were, Spoiler alert, they're between 90 and 110 the entire night because I've done the work. I have that overnight set. So if you have a CGM, it's going to help a lot to see your patterns. All right. Now, within the CGM world, you can set alerts. If you set your alerts for a little bit tighter in the night, it will alarm if you go below or above the range that you set. So for me personally, I set mine to go off if I go above 150 because I know personally I shouldn't be going above 150 while I'm sleeping. I've fine-tuned that basal insulin already. Now, you might not have a CGM, so you might not have that option, but if you do, understand you can set your alerts for your benefit. During the day, those early alerts, early warning systems, if you set your high alert for, let's say, 170, 180, instead of 250, which I know a lot of us are tempted to do because it feels better to not have alerts going off. So, that's your number two. If you have a CGM, use it to your advantage. Now, I mentioned something in the last tip, right? The CGMs looking for patterns, looking back over your previous data to establish patterns. If you notice patterns in your blood sugar management, maybe you're always running high, maybe you're always running low, maybe it's a certain part of the day that you're always running high or low. Take note of that. Write it down. Keep note. Give it to your doctor, use it for yourself, whatever it is, but recognize patterns. The earlier you can recognize patterns, the faster you can do something about it and make a big difference. Now, what I use personally, the book right there, as you can see, I've got three of them stacked up because they're amazing. It's the Trending Health Journal. This is a journal that I put together to help me control my diabetes and isolate what's happening with my blood sugars, what's going on behind the scenes. So that's a health journal that helps you track your blood sugars, kind of gives you tips on where to track, what to follow. So if you want to grab one of those real quick, head over to trendinghealthjournal.com. 
I'll put that link in the description as well. So tip number three, consistency patterns, checking for those patterns, uh, because as you recognize patterns, you can make choices yourself or bring them to your doctor to make choices for you. Now, I kind of just hinted at a, another secret, another tip that I wasn't going to include, but now I will. I mentioned consistent patterns. If you check for consistency, right, consistency will always lead to consistency. What does that mean? If you eat the same thing every day, you're gonna see better blood sugars. If you exercise the same way every day, go to bed the same time every night, you will see more stable blood sugars. Now, do you need to do that to see stable blood sugars? No, <laughs> you don't need to do that. I've done that in the past. It gave me amazing blood sugars, but you lose your quality of life. It's just not worth it. So what we wanna do is find a mix of healthy and happy, right? Find a place where you don't have to obsess over blood sugars and keep everything consistent, and you know enough of what's going on with your blood sugars so you can live a healthy, happy, fulfilling life, live in the moment. So if you're stuck in a rut or if you're trying to figure out maybe a new factor, maybe how does this type of food affect my blood sugars? If you keep things consistent, it makes it easier to recognize those patterns. Now, these next two tips are on how to avoid skyrocketing blood sugars that go way too high. We just don't want to deal with them, right? Number one is avoid overcorrecting. Now, I know a lot of our endos and doctors told us, eat 15 grams of sugar, wait 15 minutes, repeat, right? That's the rule, the rule of 15s. The problem is not all low blood sugars are the same. What happens if you are perfectly stable at 70? Technically, you're kind of pushing the limits of going low, but if you eat 15 grams of sugar, you could jump up way too far. So if you're stable and not dropping rapidly, maybe it's a little bit less than 15. Now here's the, the extra key part right here, right? Even when we are dropping fast, we get nervous, I get nervous, and sometimes we over-treat, we over-correct with the sugar. Uh, the phrase, eat the entire kitchen, sounds familiar, comes to mind for sure. There were periods of my life where I crawled to the fridge, drenched in sweat, shaking from a low blood sugar, a little bit scared because it was pretty intense, and I drank half of a, an entire quart of orange juice. That's, <laughs> that's like 150 grams of carbs. Not ideal. Of course, then we spike up and end at 300, 400, 500. We don't want to deal with that. So the rule of 15 is a great place to start. Understand that all lows are not the same. And sometimes you need a little bit less, sometimes you need a little bit more. Well, only you and your doctor can figure that one out for you. But try not to eat the whole kitchen. Try to actually wait for that sugar to absorb and see how that affects you. Now this is of course a lot easier said than done and a lot easier with a CGM as well. And the second tip I want to give you on avoiding high blood sugars, this one pertains to post meals. The pre-bolus. Now, if you're not familiar with the pre-bolus, this is when you inject your insulin, especially the, uh, the fast-acting insulins, Humalog, Novolog, and you wait about 10 to 15 minutes. The reason we do that, the reason we wait 10 to 15 minutes before our first bite of that meal, is because we want to give the insulin a chance to start working before the food jumps in there and spikes our blood sugars up, right? So what it enables to do is it, the insulin starts working around that 15 minute marker, our food absorbs a lot faster. So as a result, we give the insulin a little bit of a head start. So by the time we take that first bite, they pair up nicely and blood sugars don't go through the roof. So using your pre-bolus is gonna be a great strategy for you to avoid massive post-meal spikes uh, that you want to avoid. So work with your doctor, let us know, uh, or they'll let you know how much of a pre-bolus to use, but the general guidelines are, of course, that 10 to 15 minute marker, great place to start. And uh, sometimes it can be a little bit scary at first, but you got this, I know you do. And different types of insulins, of course, should be uh, taken into account. If you have a rapid, rapid acti acting insulin, I don't know how I'm done talking. Some insulins do work a lot faster, right? We have Fias, we have a Frezza, those are a lot quicker, and you might need less of a pre-bolus or no pre-bolus at all. So take all of these into consideration, but definitely be aware of a pre-bolus because it can, it can do some real good for you and your blood sugars. Now, the last tip I wanna give you guys today is accurate carb counting. Now, a lot of you just went, ah, <laughs> I don't wanna do that. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> that's one of the truths to being a type one diabetic. Now, easiest ways to know exactly how many carbs are in your meals, you guessed it, measuring. Now, there's a couple different ways we can do this. We can eyeball it, right, and say, I, I think that's about eh, 50 grams of carbs. We'll see how this goes. It's less likely that you're gonna nail it, right? If you use measuring cups or a food scale, 
more likely to hit perfect amount of carbs and you'll know exactly how much insulin to give for, right? So if we're trying to match insulin to carbs and the closer we get, the more tight blood sugar control we see, it only makes sense to use these, right? At least as often as possible. Now, obviously you can't take these with you. This is where different food apps are very helpful. Personally, I've used my fitness pal in the past. Um, they're a great resource. I mean, honestly, Google's great. They've got books like Calorie King. There's a lot of resources out there for you to use in order to kind of get an idea of how much carbs are in your meals when you go out to eat at restaurants. Now, there's, a, there's new research, of course, that was not included when I was first diagnosed. I was diagnosed a while ago. Uh, initially, I was told, hey, carbs are the only thing you gotta worry about. I'm gonna set these down for a second. Carbs are the only thing that matters. And of course, that's not true. We know now that things do matter outside of just carbs. Now, carbs have the most direct impact on blood sugars, but we do have to take into consideration total fat content and total protein content. Now, if you wanna understand in a deeper understanding of how to count carbs, how to read nutritional labels, definitely hit that subscribe button down below right now. I'm gonna make a future video on that, go in depth into how to read nutrition labels, how to make up your meals and understand how to inject insulin for those meals. Now, if you want to understand on a deeper level nutrition, the fats, the proteins, how to properly dose your insulin, make sure that you're taking the right amount of insulin, in addition to exercise, how that impacts blood sugars, nutrition, how the different types of foods affect blood sugars, and your mindset, if you want to control your blood sugars, you gotta keep learning. But more importantly than learning, you gotta start implementing. You gotta take action on this stuff you learn. The tips that I just went over, if you listen, cool, now you have knowledge. If you do, great, now you see results, right? Now if you want a more in-depth training, obviously this was very basic, right? If you want more in-depth knowledge to allow you to take action to see even greater results with more stable and predictable blood sugars, I invite you to check out our 80-20 blood sugar formula. This is the strategy that I use personally to keep my blood sugars in range at least 92 plus percent of the time. Some days I'll go 100% for days in a row. I wanna give you a training I did for free recently and you can find that training at diabetesinaction.com. Okay, so run over there. It's gonna ask you for your email and then give you the replay of the training I did for free. And uh, I highly recommend grabbing some notes turning off distractions, and really absorbing that info, but then what's more important, taking action, all right? So head over to diabetesinaction.com. Make sure you subscribe before you take off. Head over to that website, watch the free training, okay? So last time, diabetesinaction.com. Have an amazing day, and keep up the fight.